We need to be very careful about using biblical words religiously or unbiblically. That is, just because the words we use are the same as the Bible's words doesn't mean that we're meaning the same thing. For it's very easy to use biblical words in a way that kind of gives you the authority of the Bible, but in actual fact be saying, quite the opposite of what the Bible is meaning. It may not be the opposite, but it can be different and misleading. Take, for example, the word prayer or the example of the word praise. Look at prayer first. Does prayer mean communing with God or does it mean asking somebody for something? Uh, most people in our community would go for the first, but the Bible means the second. It just means asking somebody something. It's not necessarily even God. Or take the word praise. Does it mean worshipping divinity, worshipping God or gods? Or does it mean uh, speaking of somebody favourably? Well, it's the latter. You can praise somebody. I can say, Mark read the Bible beautifully. I've just praised him. He's not God. Uh, it doesn't mean he's God that I'm praising him or I use the word. It just means speaking in favour of somebody. Indeed, we get confused because the word praise is so commonly associated with music with us. And so if I were to say, well, look, instead of the Bible study today, we're going to have a time of praise, you'd all look up to see whether the organist was there, ready to go, and who the song leader was going to be. Because for us, a praise time is a song time. But singing does not mean praise praise speaking in favor of somebody else makes it praise I can do that with song and I can do that without song I can say Mark read the beautiful the Bible beautifully today or I could say Mark read the beautiful the Bible beautifully today the second time you didn't have to clap the second time is no more praise than the first time what it makes it praise is not that I sang, what it makes it praise is that I was speaking in favour of him. Now our psalm today starts off on the subject of singing. Sing aloud to God, our strength, shout aloud for the God of Jacob. But it's not singing to God that is being spoken of here. I mean it's a call to sing to God as the whole of verses 1 and 2 are, with musical instruments and blow the trumpet. It's all a, a call to sing to God. But while it's a call to sing to God, the emphasis is not on the singing. Indeed, it can be shouting, which I was always taught as a boy is a very different thing to singing. It sounds at first that a call to sing aloud, to raise a song, to blow the trumpet, all has to do with music, but the emphasis is not on singing to God, the emphasis is on singing to God. That's the important part of what's being called upon. For it's about a joyful shout about him. He's the subject, he's the object of our praise. He is the reason for our singing and shouting and music. We are to call and shout with joy to God the good life that he has given to his people. In James chapter 5, we're taught, if anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise. It's, it's not just sing, but singing the songs of praise about God. Because all good things have come from God, and if your life is full, 
then rejoice in the fullness of your life, but rejoice towards God because he has made it full. Remember God in the time of bounty. It's easy to remember God in the time of hardship. It's easy to remember God when everything's going wrong, when I'm sick, when I'm in pain. I call upon God like you wouldn't believe. My capacity for concentrating on my prayer life is enormously enhanced when I'm in pain. But when I'm not in pain, I forget to thank God and to rejoice in God and the good health that he has given me. That, that's a much harder thing to remember. And this psalm is a psalm of joy, of sheer pleasure in God is what he's being spoken of. Joyful singing to God, of music, of shouting to God, of blowing the ram's horn, the, the trumpet, of making noise in favour of God. We do make noise in favour. You watch a football game, you go to a concert. When we're in favour of people, we shout, we yell, we clap, we make noise in favour of the person. It's part of the joy of living itself as an expression of our heart's admiration of what the person has done. And so the question really is, why? Why should I shout for joy? Why should I sing aloud to God? And the answer of the psalm has got to do with the Exodus ordinance. So verse 4. For it, it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. It's because of God's decree that we should do it. God has given us a decree, a statute, a rule. This is given to Israel, of course. The psalm appears to have the reference to the exodus and its rules, its ordinances of the harvest festival, of the feast of the tabernacles, of the feast of the tents. For come the seventh month, the ram's horn was to be blasted with great news of celebration at the end of the harvest time when they would rejoice with God. And so it is a joyful praise at the end of harvest, joyfully celebrating God's goodness in providing the harvest for us, praising in the good provisions of God. I'm a city dweller, and I don't really always get the hang of harvest things. But even I, whose life has now plunged as far west as living in Piedmont, even I can understand that come the end of harvest time has got to be, for the agricultural community, the big party. That is the time at which, you, if you're going to have a barbecue and get everybody around from all your neighbours to have a party, the end of harvest time is the obvious time. And the people of Israel, that is what they did under the commands and rules of God. The harvest festival is a time of joyful praise to God. So at the full moon of the day of our feast, verse 4 talks of this statute and rule and verse 5 of the rule in the time of Egypt. And we cannot be sure it's exactly the Feast of the Tabernacles because that's not mentioned, but the mention of the full moon and the festival and the harvest provisions that it's instituted by the decree of God all reminds us of the laws about that festival. Because the Exodus meant rescue for the people not just provision and at this point the Israelite harvest festival quite different to the Canaanite harvest festival or nearly anybody else's for the Canaanites the classic example here the Canaanites the neighbors worshipped nature gods fertility gods in overly sexualized temple worship using sacred prostitutes, whereby through sympathetic magic the gods could be appeased and brought to give us fresh crops. But at harvest time in Israel, they celebrated the exodus out of Egypt. They celebrate that time when God brought them out of slavery into the promised land of plenty. And so verse 5 he made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over or went out against the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known, reminding them of the judgment time of Egypt, when the people of Israel were not living in the freedom of God's people, but in slavery, 
And yet God went out against them. As you can see, verse 6, he relieved your shoulders of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. That is the rescue of God for the people of Israel out of Egypt, across the, dry, across the desert, into the promised land, in that rescue that they are to remember at this moment at harvest time, they are reminded of the waters of Meribah. Now for some of us we don't know too much about the waters of Meribah. And the key thing to know about the waters of Meribah is that they weren't there. That's the key thing to understand. For out in the desert the people were thirsty. And when thirsty they grumbled against God and against Moses. And they put God to the test. It's recorded for us in Exodus 17 and Numbers 20. But in Psalm 81, it's not them putting God to the test, but God putting them to the test. And so he says, verse 7, the end of verse 7, I tested you at the waters of Meribah. And the test on the people of Israel was a test that they failed. They failed because they didn't trust God to provide for them as he had promised he would. They failed because they complained that they should never have been taken out of Egypt. They failed because even Moses failed when he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. From the Exodus account across the desert, we find what God was teaching the people back at Meribah and the like in Deuteronomy chapter 8. For there it says, how you must remember that he humbled you, that you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man doesn't live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God's mouth. Very important. The whole experience of Israel was to, in the wilderness was to humble them so they would know that message. It's such an important message to learn. That we live by the promises of God. Because God speaks we live and because God speaks we must trust him because he promises we must stand on his promises live by his promises trust him in his promises it's not a matter of automatic or sympathetic magic that we get the crops that we get we get them because God has promised them to us is the point of Israel. When we were in Egypt, when we were in slavery, God promised us a land full of milk and honey, a land full of wealth. God promised us that. Our job was to keep trusting his promises all the way there, but we didn't trust his promises. We complained, well, where is everything? Where is the land? Where is the milk? Where is the honey? Where's the water? We'd prefer to be back eating the leeks in Egypt than this garbage that you're giving us here. Where is the food? They put God to the test instead of trusting him. We cannot coerce gods to send us prosperity like some kind of cargo cult. The God of the Bible gives us what he promises. To the Israelites, back Psalm 81, he promised them wealth in the promised land. That was the promise. And so it was a matter of thanksgiving and joy each time you come to the harvest. When you come to the harvest time, don't just rejoice in the fact that there's so much. Rejoice in the fact that it was God who promised it to us way back then. Remember Meribah, when you didn't thank God and you didn't trust God and you didn't rely upon God. Because man doesn't live by bread alone, man lives by the promises of God. By the word, of, if it wasn't for the promises of God, we wouldn't have this harvest. 
So where is the Canaanites will be thanking their lucky stars? Where is the Canaanites will be saying, we did a terrific job? Where is the Canaanites will be saying, I hope the gods will be fertile again next year? The people of Israel will be saying, remember Meribah when we didn't have water? Remember that what we've got, we've got because God has promised us. Remember, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Remember, and do so with joy and thanksgiving. And so the Israelites in the promised land, whenever they came to harvest, were to celebrate with thanksgiving to God. But their celebration involved remembering the exodus, remembering the hard times in the wilderness, remembering how he humbled them with hunger and with thirst in order that they might know that it is God who's provided everything. So if the harvest is to be celebrated remembering that we live by the word of God, then our chief responsibility must lie in listening to God. And that sets up the real theme of the psalm. For although many people will take verses 1 and 2 and 3 and turn it into a little song and sing it every week, that's just the introduction. That's not really what the psalm is about. The psalm is really about verses 8 following. It's about listening to the word of God. That is the real theme. It's not just praising God in songs and shouts, but listening and trusting in God. Don't you like to go to a meeting where you're told you're doing the right thing? Come to the Cathedral Bible Study. I'll tell you each time you're doing the right thing being here. Listening to the Word of God in the middle of a busy working week is the right thing to do, as it is when you get up in the morning and when you go to bed at night. But I'm not seeing you there and there, so I can only tell you about now. This is the right thing to do. Keep reading the Word of God. But in listening... Notice the warning of verse 8. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you, O Israel, if you would but listen to me, if you would listen to me, then you would have not have other gods, not have other foreign gods, as he says there in verse 9. No idols. For I am Yahweh, the God, your God. I am Yahweh, the Lord, your God, he says in verse 10. The Lord, your God, who rescued you out of Egypt. Remember the plagues by which I beat Pharaoh? Remember the Red Sea by which you crossed into safety? Remember Mount Sinai when you received the law of God? Remember Meribah? where you rebelled against me and how I did provide the waters for you. Remember the wandering in the wilderness. Remember, I am the one who rescued from Egypt and I didn't rescue you so that you would die in the desert. I rescued you so that you would live in plenty in my land, in my promised land. And so open, end of verse 10, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. God wants to give generously to them. But the problem with the children of Israel in the wilderness was that they would not listen. Notice verses 11 and 12. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Here is the sad history of Israel in the Bible, summed up in a single motto, they didn't listen to my voice. They would not listen, not in the time of Moses in the wilderness, not in the time of the conquest under Joshua, not when the judges were ruling the land, nor when the kings came into the land, they would not listen. And so what does God do when people do not listen to him? God gave them over to their own stupidity. Verse 12, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. God's method of judgment in this world is permissiveness. That's an old word for some of us, but in the 1960s it was a very fashionable word. It was the ultimate good word. We came to what was called the permissive society and the permissive society was the high point of civilization. We're still reaping the whirlwind of the 1960s permissiveness. 
Permissiveness is the judgment of God. God permits people to do their own thing. He gives them up to their own sinful desires, to ruin their own lives, their own way. You want life without me, would say God? Well, you can have life without me. But friend, remember, every good thing that is in this world comes from God. Remember, life without God is death, in fact. The supposedly Chinese curse, I understand it actually isn't a Chinese curse, but the supposedly Chinese curse is, may you live in interesting times. The Bible's curse is, may you run your own life. That's a dreadful way to live. God has not fully given up his people of Israel at this psalm. For you'll notice in verse 13 he says, Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe towards him and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of the wheat and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. If you would but listen to me, for God is eager to bless, eager to subdue the enemies, eager to fulfill the harvest with bounty beyond expression. God is more willing, my friends, to hear our prayers than we are to ask them. And God is more able to do things than we ask, far more able to do all that we ask or ever even think. But we must listen to him. And listening is more than just hearing. Listening is hearing with understanding. Obeying him. Following him. Submitting to him. It's not just hearing. It's got to do with hearing. It's got to do with obeying God from your heart. And this response of listening like this is still the right response for God's people today. I mean, that's why we're here now. I'm really glad you're here now. Do come, do bring your friends, keep coming week by week. It is terrifically important to keep hearing the word of God. Well done. But of course, you can hear and not listen, can't you? That, that's all too easy for us, isn't it? To hear and not listen. My friends, it's easy to preach and not listen. That's a simple thing to do. Because we've got to actually seek to obey what the author is saying to us, what God is saying to us. When John came with the great message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he commenced with the word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word, he says, became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For though God had spoken to us in many ways, in various times, especially through the prophets, yet he has spoken to us in these last times, says the author to the Epistle of the Hebrews. He has spoken to us in these last times by his very Son who is the radiance of his glory, who is the very imprint of his nature. And so we must listen to him. For if the people of Israel all were punished in the wilderness for not listening to a message that came by angels through a man, how shall we escape if we ignore the message that has come to us through the very Son of God? We must listen. For Christians, this word of truth has been implanted within us. In James chapter 1, we read every good and perfect gift, verse 17, comes from above for the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Verse 18, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness that God requires. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word, not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. This word of God, you see, brings us new life, verse 18. It is implanted within us, verse 21. And it saves our souls, verse 21. And that's why we are to be, in verse 19, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow of anger. That is why we've got to receive with meekness that implanted word, that saves us and so we must in verse 22 be doers of the word not just hearers people who only hear deceive themselves for every good gift comes from God verse 17 and you won't miss out on anything and so we have to listen to the word of God today as we rise as we go to work as we come home as we're at lunchtime Every day is the right day to listen to the Word of God. Not tomorrow, nothing wrong with listening to the Word of God tomorrow, but you're not in control of tomorrow. You're not even sure you're going to have it tomorrow. Today is the day you listen. Not yesterday. I'm glad you listened to the Word of God yesterday, but that was yesterday. Today is the day in which you and I live, and in the day in which we live is the day in which we must listen to the Word of God. Talking is a lot easier than listening. Cathedral Bible study, we both work, you and I. You do more work than I do. It's easy for me to stay awake. It's very difficult for me to fall asleep while talking, although I have given it a try. It's much harder for you to keep concentrating on what is being said. And it's hard when you hear what someone else says to actually take it within yourself and to turn it into how you live. But that is the one who has spoken to us, God who has implanted this word within us to bring us to new life, that we might live his way, not our way. And so every day is a good day to hear the word of God, knowing that God is more willing to bless us than we are to ask for his blessings. If we will but listen to his word. And then, of course, receiving those blessings we will shout to the Lord with joy. For the Lord is the one who has given us everything in which we rejoice.